terrible Haji Asbat's truth, there was nothing whatsoever to be seen on my leg. When Haji Asbat's troop ascertained this, he immediately leaped from his place like a young man and cried out very excitedly, It cannot be! and began to stare fixedly at my left leg with the eyes of a madman. Almost five minutes passed in this manner. I confess that for the first time on that planet I was at a loss and could not immediately hit upon a way out of the situation. At last he came closely up to me, and was about to speak. But just then, from his agitation, his legs began to tremble very violently. And he therefore sat down on the floor and motioned me to sit down also. And when we were seated, he gazed at me with very sorrowful eyes, and in a penetrating manner spoke to me as follows. Friend of my friend, in my youth I was a very rich man, so rich that no fewer than ten of my caravans, each with no fewer than a thousand camels, were constantly moving in all directions over our great Asia. My harem was considered by all who knew it to be the richest and best on the earth, and everything else was on the same scale. In short, I had, in superabundance, everything that our ordinary life can give. But all this gradually so wearied and surfeited me, that when at night I lay down to sleep, I thought with horror that the same would be repeated on the next day, and that I would again have to drag along the same wearisome burden. Finally, it became unendurable for me to live with such an inner state. And then, once, when I felt the emptiness of ordinary life particularly strongly, the idea first arose in me of ending my life by suicide. For several days, I thought quite cold-bloodedly and as a result categorically decided to do this. On the last evening, as I entered the room where I intended to actualize this decision of mine, I suddenly remembered that I had not taken a last look at her who was half the cause of the creation and formation of my life. I remembered, namely, my own mother, who was then still alive, and this recollection of her reversed everything within me. I suddenly pictured to myself how she would suffer when she learned of my end, and moreover by such a means. When I remembered her, I pictured to myself, as if in reality, how she, my dear old mother, would break down in utter loneliness with resigned sighs and inconsolable sufferings. And from all this there arose in me such a pity for her that the sobbing evoked by this pity almost choked me. And it was only just then that I cognized with my whole being what my mother meant to me, and what an inextinguishable feeling towards her ought to exist in me. From that time, my mother became for me the source of my life. Thereafter, Whenever it may have been, day or night, no sooner did I remember her dear face than I became animated with new strength and the desire to live, and to do everything only that her life might flow agreeably for her was renewed in me. Thus it continued for ten years, until from one of those pitiless diseases she passed away and I was again left alone. After her death, my inner emptiness again began to weigh me down more and more, day by day. At this point of his narrative, when the glance of the venerable Haji Asvat's truth happened to light upon the dervish Boga Eden, he again jumped up from his place and, addressing him, said, My dear friend, in the name of our friendship, pardon me, an old man, 
that I have forgotten to put an end to the pain caused you from the evil carrying vibrations of the grand piano. Having said this, he sat down at the grand piano and again began to strike the keys. This time he produced the sounds of two notes only, one from among those of the higher octaves of the grand piano and the other from among the lower, always alternately. And as he began, he almost shouted, now, thanks again to the vibrations engendered by means of the sounds of the grand piano, but this time good carrying ones, let the pain of my faithful old friend cease. And indeed, five minutes had scarcely passed before the face of the dervish Boga Eden again cleared up, and of the enormous, horrible boil which until that time had continued to ornament his left leg, not a trace remained. Then the dervish Haji Asvats Truv again sat down beside us and externally completely calm, continued to talk. On the fourth day after the death of my dear mother, I happened to be sitting in my room thinking in despair what was to become of me. Just then, in the street near my window, a wandering dervish began to chant his sacred canticles. Looking out of the window and seeing that the singing dervish was old and had a very benign face, I suddenly decided to ask his advice and immediately sent my servant to invite him in. And when he had entered and, after the usual salutations, was seated on the mindari, I told him of my soul state without withholding anything at all. When I finished, the wandering dervish became intensely thoughtful, and only after some time, looking at me steadily, he said, as he rose from his place, There is only one way out for you. Devote yourself to religion. Having said this, he walked away, uttering some prayer, and left my house forever. After his departure, I again became thoughtful. This time, the result of my thinking was that I decided the same day, irrevocably, to enter some brotherhood of dervishes, but only not in my native country, but somewhere further away. The next day, I began to divide and distribute all my wealth among my relatives and the poor, and in two weeks, I left my native country forever and came here to Bokhara. Once here in Bokhara, I chose one of the numerous brotherhoods of dervishes and entered it, selecting just that brotherhood whose dervishes were known among the people for the severity of their mode of life. But unfortunately, the dervishes of this brotherhood soon produced a disillusioning effect on me, and I therefore transferred to another brotherhood. But there again the same thing happened, until finally I was enrolled as a dervish of the Brotherhood of the Monastery, the Sheik of which set me the task of devising that mechanical stringed musical instrument of which I have already spoken to you. And after that, as I have also already told you, I became very much absorbed in the science of the laws of vibrations and have been occupied with it up to the present day. But today, this science has compelled me to experience the same inner state as I experienced for the first time on the eve of the death of my mother, whose love 